it off. That's better. There we go. Woo! Yeah, for people who don't know who I am, um, I'm a Linux distribution engineer at SUSE, you know, so like I'm a human on planet Earth. Um, I'm a former sysadmin and QA engineer, been working with OpenSUSE since 2005, mostly on like the GNOME side of things, lots of testing, antiquity, packaging. Um, until Monday, I was also chairman of the OpenSUSE project. Um, now I'm just an engineer. I take photos, I've been running it there. And the reason I'm here is, you know, two years ago, I came to Guadec and told everybody how I didn't like Flatpak, and I didn't like Snap, and I didn't like AppImage. Um, and yeah, now I kind of have a confession to make. Um, but before about that, I have to explain how I got here in two years. Um, these slides, of course, weren't really prepared, so I'm just going to skip through a bunch of them. You know, OpenSUSE, large project, lots of sub-projects as part of that, including these days more than one Linux distribution. You know, we used to just do the one traditional OpenSUSE distribution, um, but, you know, things have diversified, the world's got more interesting, we have container OpenSUSE, we have system management focused OpenSUSE variants, um, but the main two being OpenSUSE Tumbleweed, our rolling release, always being updated, always being tested, and that testing having a very kind of user uh, experience centric point of view, you know, testing with OpenQA, actually automating the workflows that users are actually doing, typing the things they're typing, seeing the screens they're seeing, um, you know, and being sort of very yeah, developer and power user centric, and OpenSUSE Leap, which is our unique hybrid variant of you know, community stuff and enterprise code base, you know, all mashed together because with SUSE and OpenSUSE, we have this sort of kind of unique relationship where, you know, the, the company is, is actively contributing the enterprise code base straight into OpenSUSE, you know, uh, I, literally as an enterprise SUSE engineer, I can't get anything into my enterprise code base unless it's in OpenSUSE first. Um, and unlike in, in other situations where, um, you know, the enterprise release might get hap might happen and then the community variant of that happens, you know, six months later, you know, in the case of with, with SUSE, the enterprise code base is being developed at the same time as OpenSUSE Leap. So, in fact, the community version has a habit of being released like one month before because we don't have to wait for the certification to finish. Um, and, you know, life is good, all, you know, all moving nice and quickly. And this is what I've been doing for, like, years and years and years. Um, part of that is, oh yeah, kind of irrelevant there. Part of the problem we're solving with OpenSUSE these days, you know, is this problem of, you know, open source is moving quicker and quicker and quicker. You know, the kernel is constantly pumping out new versions. Six months releases for, for GNOME are a known quantity these days. But, you know, even big projects like Kubernetes and Docker, you know, releasing you know, every three months or, you know, Podman, you know, every couple of weeks, I've missed at least one update just traveling here, to, you know, for the, for the conference. Um, and, you know, we're, we're trying to solve this traditional software distribution problem. How to, you know, split, you know, how to condense all of these changes into something that people can actually use. And we've tried to solve that in Tumbleweed. Um, it originally started by, by Greg Crow Hartman, the kernel engineer, back in 2014. Oh, actually, no, before that. Um, 2011, I think, is when he started it. Um, and, and he took an approach of taking the, the stable, regular release open suits we had at the time and basically bolting on a faster moving add-on repository above that. Um, the problem with that is, you know, that faster moving bit above, you know, needed to have faster moving libraries, which then, of course, needed to change stuff in the lower level stack, which was meant to be stable. So you had this sort of constant push me, pull you hybrid where the faster moving stuff either was moving too fast and causing us to break everything below or the faster moving part on top couldn't move as fast as you wanted. Um, and we realized the only way of really solving that was throwing out this concept of not moving equals stable. You know, having a distribution that doesn't move doesn't make it more stable than a distribution that does just got to solve the issues that, you know, that moving cause to stability. So in the case of Tumbleweed, we started, you know, effectively looking at implementing CI at a distribution level, you know, making sure everything can change, making sure if we need to update literally every single library from square one 
in order to just change that one little thing for user space, we can and the world isn't going to end. Um, so we implemented OpenQA, uh, which is a key part of the, the, the sort of OpenSUSE and SUSE story these days. You know, every single change in any SUSE code base is getting hundreds and thousands of these tests. Um, you know, everything from checking RAID levels to checking, you know, how does GNOME look today? Are the applications actually loading? Is it all working? Um, we, you know, we have this pipeline that, you know, these days you'd call this a CI pipeline, but, you know, we kind of did it before CI was trendy, where every single change to OpenSUSE, you know, gets submitted, gets put through a, a small subset of these tests, these tests immediately, so we know every submission is not going to break our entire code base. At that point, we actually bother to manually review it as well, because, you know, we still want to make sure we're not doing anything totally stupid. After the manual review, we test everything together as one sort of big cohesive unit. And, and, and with this approach, you know, we're able to move Tumbleweed, which is a distribution with like 25,000 binary package these days, you know, at a cadence of four or five releases a week. Um, so all good, all great, but the, I kind of started realizing that when, when you look at the real world, you know, the, move has, the world has moved on from the problems that that distribution really kind of solves. Um, when I think of my first computer, you know, it was a Commodore 64. Yes, it took like 30 minutes to load anything from a tape. Um, and we had this sort of mindset of, you know, if you needed a computer to do more than one thing, you had more than one computer. Um, so we got more than one computer and, you know, we started networking and, you know, the world's got more and more connected. Um, and as part of that, kind of more connected world, what have we all introduced as engineers? Well, we've made everything more complicated. You know, if you think of in sort of forget the desktop world for a moment and to kind of focus on the server side of things, you know, the more servers you have, the more infrastructure you need, the more networking you need, the more switches, aircon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it costs your CFO more money because it's, you know, capital budget's always a pain in the ass. There's more configuration management required. You know, you have more machines, you have more drift. You know, we see this in the desktop world, you know, more demons is, you know, more config files cluttering up everyone's home directory. And more things to patch, more complexity in that patching. So, again, sort of focusing a little bit on the server world, you know, traditional sysadmin 101 has been, well, okay, fine, we'll just minimize the number of servers in use. So, you know, for the last 20 years, you know, almost every sysadmin has been doing his best to have as few physical machines as possible and have them do as much as possible. You know, that might be one clunky bare metal machine running 20 or 30 services or one bare metal machine running 30 or 40 VMs. Um, but the, the general end goal was the same. You know, have machines do as little as possible, or sorry, as much as possible with as few machines as you can. Um, but that doesn't necessarily make any of this stuff any easier. Um, you know, you've got fewer machines, so you've got less c machines with configuration to worry about, but that configuration is way more complicated. You know, you've, you've got, yeah, you know, less physical machines to buy, but, you know, they're all bigger, clunkier machines with more RAM sticks and more CPUs that, you know, end up failing and taking the entire machine down at some point. When you've got more and more services clogging up these machines, even when you isolate it in VMs or containers or, or whatever you're using to kind of stack this stuff up, you know, the increase of services end up meaning there's more ways those things are going to interact and break and start things falling over. So you have, you know, incompatibilities between services or, or you have kind of, you know, problem pooling, you know, problem A ends up slowing down your CPU, which ends up knocking down service B and C and everything, you know, everything collapses and everything gets more complicated. And, you know, everyone then tells me, well, this is what the cloud solves, right? We throw it up on the cloud and we don't have to worry about this stuff anymore. But, you know, the reality is it's just more complicated. It happens there even more than it does sort of in the old traditional data centers. And so, you know, as developers, we've modulized everything and, you know, the, the new world is one full of, you know, containers and, and virtualization and, and IoT. Um, and looking at it from this point of view, I realized more and more, you know, the, the sysadmins coming out of school these days, you know, are pretty much thinking in terms of sort of single purpose systems. You know, they have a VM, that VM does one job, 
and just does one job. And you know that's that one VM will contain a minimal number of services, minimal number of stuff in there. Yeah, in there, it, patching's quite often ignored. You know, just rip, replace, throw a new VM in there, and that solves a bunch of these sort of generic problems. You know, there's fewer machines to manage, the configurations less because you know there's just a few things in a little VM, and generally it's a more efficient use of hardware. But you're still left with this issue of more and more machines with more and more configuration, you know, more and more VMs in this case, needing to be, you know, needing to be managed and, and managed across multiple machines. They need to be patched, they need to be kept up to, up to date and secure, and yeah, need to be as small as possible. So we've been looking at this from SUSE initially from this sort of sys admin point of view of kind of minimizing this problem scope for, for the, the, the data center world um, and we've been looking at this this concept of, of you know, transactional administration, you know, atomic updates, as, you know, immutable OSs, you know, the you know, same thing, you know, in different language. Um, but you know, the general premise being any change to any system should be able to be you know, reliably, reproducibly, and reversibly applied to that system. Um, and that reversibility, in, in particular, is of importance to us because at Susan, that's been sort of something we've been dabbling with now for like 15 years with our our love affair with BTRFS. And you know, you've also got sysadmins who, for years, have been saying you know they never want to touch a running system, and yet you know we almost all, in some way, force users to touch a running system. So we have a transactional update stack. Um, we didn't come up with a great snazzy name for it. We kind of just called it transactional updates. Um, but for us, that is, you know, an atomic operation to update and uh, update the system. It applies the entire thing all in one go or not at all. It doesn't influence the running system at all. Um, but in, in our case, it does actually it does actually do the update while the system is running. So it's not a case of like you're rebooting; it patches on the next boot. You know, we actually use the running system to quietly prepare the update alongside, as I'll explain in a minute, and then you know, flick in the smallest, quickest atomic operation we can. It can be rolled back, and in fact, we also want that rollback to happen automatically as detected when the thing goes wrong. So we have a tool that we've been using for years called Snapper, uh, nothing to do with SnapD, um, which is the OpenSUSE tool for taking a snapshot of a running system. Um, it's what we use with BTRFS. Whenever you change the system, we take snapshots so you can roll back. What we do with transactional update is we don't snapshot the running system. We create a snapshot for the system's future state. So look at the current running system, create a BTRFS snapshot, and then basically redirect the traditional commands that we would traditionally do with our traditional package manager with our traditional packages. So no case of like our PMOS tree where we're having to repackage everything and redeliver things via the new means. You know, we're still using sort of all the traditional OpenSUSE tumbleweed packages we've had since forever, but they're redirected via nothing much more complicated than a ch root into that snapshot. So they patch that new snapshot all of the operations happen in there. The running system doesn't get affected at all. Assuming they all get applied properly, that snapshot that then gets targeted as the next boot target. So you reboot your system and you move from state A to state B. The nice thing is that also means we can nest all this sort of nasty, ugly stuff that quite often happens in packages of, you know, post scripts and, you know, other side channel scripts and, you know, users can update the entire OS to a different set of packages and you know, whatever, all can be contained via this model in this single snapshot. And if it all goes horribly wrong and the services don't start up the way they're meant to start up, on first boot we have a system D target, a system D service that basically goes, okay, that snapshot was bad, throws it away and reboots again back to the previous state. So fully automatic rollback when it all goes horribly wrong. And we call this sort of snazzy stack of uh, OpenSUSE with this transactional update, OpenSUSE microOS, um, which has a read-only root file system. So you know nothing is going to be changing that root file system besides the transactional update stack. We use Salt to kind of uh, smooth a couple of rough edges with configuration across multiple machines. 
Um, and we've optimized the footprint as, as much as possible. So this isn't like traditional OpenSUSE where we install you know, hundreds of recommended packages alongside the stack. You know, we've trimmed it down to about a 400 megabyte footprint these days. Um, and I'm, we're trying our best to kind of keep it under there. But um, un, unlike other options where you only can get this as a VM image because we're doing it with traditional packages, you know, you can get this as a VM image, you can get it as an installation DVD, you can install it using YAST if you want to, you know, and customize it a little bit as part of that initial installation because, you know, kind of pulling all of the best stuff from the old world and into the, into the new stuff as well. Um, OpenSUSE MicroS based on Tumbleweed. In fact, it is Tumbleweed. It's using the same repositories. It's using the same binaries. Um, just has different installation media. Um, it's therefore built and tested as part of that whole process. So, um, you know, this, the, the kernel gets tested now sort of, you know, two ways to Sunday, both in the read-only MicroS scenarios and in the, uh, the sort of traditional OpenSUSE ways. And sometimes that brings up interesting issues. Sometimes it doesn't. Um, and it also means we've tied those two pipelines together. So, you know, a bad day for Tumbleweed stops me releasing MicroS. A bad day for MicroS stops anybody getting Tumbleweed snapshots. Um, which keeps me honest and uh, keeps things moving kind of smoothly because, yeah, I make a mistake and everybody's yelling at me. As I already mentioned, we have a whole bunch of different ways of deploying it. DVD, the traditional old way, VM images, Raspberry Pi, because, yeah, we also have a new uh, stack called Yomi, which isn't really relevant to this, but the idea, you know, boot off a network image and just install it all using nothing but salt configuration um, and cloud native ignition. And when we were first thinking of this, well, yeah, I'll slip backwards. We were thinking of it purely in the kind of context of Kubernetes. You know, we started this entire process, you know, with the data center world, trying to build a perfect Kubernetes operating system. We call that OpenSUSE Cubic, which is basically just microOS with Cubic on top. It's certified by the CNCF. But we've realized more and more that this platform, you know, has a lot of other potential. You know, it, it's the perfect operating system for a lot of these small IoT devices. You know, we have an ARM build. It's 400 meg, a little bit bigger than you might want, but, you know, small enough. Auto-updating, auto-patching, auto-rollback. I mean, why not use it? You know, single-service VMs, container hosts, appliances. And then I started kind of getting addicted to this thing. You know, my next cloud is running microOS. My blog is running microOS. My TV is now running microOS. And that's when I started realizing that I'd accidentally built something that needed Flatpak. Because I'd installed, yeah, installed microOS. I'd installed a GUI. I'd started using XFCE and I started getting more and more stressed and pissed off because it was XFCE. And I wanted to go back to GNOME. And, you know, I, the, 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 yeah, the, the, the simple reality is, you know, microOS is perfect for when you don't want to worry about the operating system. You know, it takes care of itself, it reboots itself and all that stuff. But when you look at it from a user's point of view, you know, we, you know, it's, I've already got a prototype image where I've got microOS and GNOME and, you know, that's kind of handled the traditional OpenSUSE way done and dusted but I don't want to go rebooting my machine every time I install a new app. So I need to have the apps coming from something other than the transactional update stack. You know, I can't use OpenSUSE's RPMs for that you know, at all. Um, so I need to have an app ecosystem that you know, works perfectly fine, can be installed kind of by the users, fits in with the, sort of, you know, the simple reality of you know, users can't do anything with the root file system, so you know, they've just got to live inside their home directory. And Flathub, Flatpak, that ecosystem is there. It works. It's done. Um, so um, my, my plan, um, okay, I've got a prototype, but basically I intend to be building a microOS desktop using all of this microOS stuff that we've, we've got and basically drawing kind of the scope of the line for OpenSUSE being GNOME Shell. And everything above that I basically want to have from Flatpak, Flathub, I'm going to be going to Andrew, uh, Alexander's talk later about you know running our own repository, but at the moment I don't necessarily see the point of that. You know I think the flat hopefully the flat hub ecosystem is healthier than it was two years ago when I was saying all those nasty things, and if it isn't, I want to be helping to you know get it up to that level where it can work. Um, and 
that's yeah that's kind of it with my talk really I mean does anybody find this interesting to want to contribute to it because this is a side project for me unfortunately I have other stuff to do at work um, and I don't want to do this all on my own but if no one does find it interesting does anybody have any ideas of what I should be thinking about my the, the number one issue I have at the moment is really an, an open source of packaging foible where yeah for years we've been doing everything with with package kit we've got our zipper package kit backend which is like hard coded to be the only package kit backend we install all the time and that doesn't work with transactional updates so i have to write a transactional update backend or repackage it so you know there, i just want to have gnome software with just showing the flat hub stuff i don't want it to be showing all of the other stuff in tumbleweed you know i kind of want it to be yeah, flat packed only from the user's perspective um, I am thinking of having some basic applications from GNOME Shell, kind of, you know, things like calculators and get it maybe from the RPMs just so there's something. Um, so you kind of, kind of like you get on a sort of mobile device world, you know, the, the manufacturer provides a bunch of basic apps and then everyone, everything else comes from an app store. Um, yes. Um, so this is all fairly new to me, um, but I did hear a great deal at Lost last year about Fedora Silverblue. Yep. Um, seemed similar. Yep. The, the the similar logic. Said, yep. Um, from my understanding of Fedora Silverblue, uh, they don't even include yum as part of like the base installation, meaning that there is no traditional Wait, is that correct? Am I correct on that? That Yum's not in the base Silverboot package? I've never actually. Uh, my, my understanding is, yeah, because they're using RPM OS tree, for them it would make no sense. Um, okay. So. So there's no Yum, but you can install traditional packages. Okay. And am I, yeah, am I, am I right in thinking that, does that overlay still slow down the boot every time you do it? Eventually, like if you do it like a hundred different packages. Okay. But yeah, but anyway, that's, because that's, that's one reason why we took this route. Okay, so an update, yeah. That's, that's one of the reasons why we took our, this approach because we, we avoid that problem of like, you know, multiple layers, it's, you know, everything's always the same because we're just moving from one snapshot to another. So it's. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so and it's a silver blue update that doesn't have an delayed package is basically a git pull do the checkout and then boot into that. Yeah. But if you layer things, there is the download things, check out, apply whatever layered stuff you have, and then boot and switch into that. The next boot, you still have it, and you don't have to redo the layering every boot. Got you. But you do have to uh, redo it when you rebase on the new version. Understood. So when you assume new RPM OS3 update. But it's not neat, that is not necessarily slower than your solution because that also, like, applies all the updates in a traditional way. Yeah. So, so. Yeah. It's, it's not, it's quite similar. Yeah, it's quite similar. I, I guess. Yeah. I mean, if, if I were to be, like, bad to you, I would say that I would prefer um, the Silver Blue version because you're, if, you're, if you're not layering anything, you're guaranteed to get the same content at the client's machine every time, whereas yours still depends on, like, the order of when things were updated and whatnot. Like if you, if, if you, two people do an update at different times, even, at, even if they end up at the same version set at the end, they might have gone there in, in a different way. Like if you only update it once a month versus update every day, you might end up with the bytes differing at the end. Potentially, yeah. Potentially. It's, it's not a huge thing, but that's one of the things that I think is nice about an image-based operating system versus like a, something that updates using 
running scripts at each machine. Yeah. I mean, one nice one nice thing we've we've had with this is you know we we avoid some of the issues like the the endless guys have of needing to have like checksums and, yeah. and you know go back to that because you know we you know we're always applying. So yeah, when we have those weird gaps of, of like yeah, someone who hasn't updated for a month, you know, all we have to do is put that logic in the packages and they they take care of themselves. Yeah. You know, like like when I moved the RPM database from a completely different subvolume to you know a different part of the OS, and no one noticed. So, yeah, e each way has their benefits. Yeah. Uh, any more questions? Because I've still got a couple of minutes, or comments, or suggestions, or hate. <laughs> Two thumbs up, hearts. Okay, that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could. I'm. I'm. I, it would be less embarrassing now than it would have been if I did it two days ago. But still, no. the invitation is open. The invitation. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I, I've looked at RPM OS three. It's not for me. I mean, we when when we started this journey, it's kind of why I wanted to give the whole context. When we started this journey, you know, RPM OS three was already a bit of a thing, um, and you know, given. You know our background with BTRFS versus what you guys are doing. It's like we, we're just coming at it from a, a different kind of world understanding, um, and I, I don't think I'm ever going to quite understand how RPM OS tree works in comparison. Yeah, I'm, I'm never going to like it. I'm too much of a BTRFS fanboy. Sorry. Cool. Okay then. Thank you very much. <laughs>